Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast. My name is Philip and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 21, Fragments of Menander. Last time, Menander's only surviving complete play took centre stage and we saw how new comedy focused on the more realistic and domestic stories that raised maybe a soft chuckle in the audience rather than the belly laugh that came from the thought-provoking but fantastical situations presented in old comedy. Old had become new, and the middle-class, moneyed audience were happy, it seems, to be gently amused rather than challenged in the theatre. In this shorter-than-usual episode, and to conclude the review of Menander's plays, I'm now going to look at the three largest fragments we have, so that we can get a better sense of the scope of his work. The Girl from Samos was produced sometime between 315 and 309 BCE, with most commentators believing in the later date. The surviving text has large sections of Act 1 and 2 badly damaged and undecipherable, but it's been possible to deduce the content of the missing passages given the surviving parts. We learn in the opening prologue, delivered by Moschion, that he is of a rich family, headed by his adoptive father Demias. Moschion introduces the story as something that happened in the past and that he is now deeply ashamed of. His father kept a mistress, Crisis, in the family home and there was a time when she was pregnant and Demius was on a long business trip with his neighbour, Nicaretus, who had a daughter, Plangen. To his shame, while the two men were absent, Moschion seduced Plangen. He swore to do the right thing by her, but before the father's return, the baby was born and given to Chrysis, who had suffered a miscarriage at about the same time. Moschion and his servant Parmenon try to prepare the explanation needed to persuade the fathers that he should marry Plangen, but Chrysis says she has no plans to part with the baby and wants to claim it as her own. They leave as the old men return and recall their travels. They then agree that their respective son and daughter should marry, but it's not clear from the surviving text why this is done. The second act is very damaged text, but we can see that there is an argument between father and son about the marriage and turning the child out. It ends with Demius agreeing to the marriage and a preparation for a feast. In Act 3, Demius reveals that he has overheard that the baby is his son's and not his. He extracts confirmation of this from the cook, but then convinces himself that Chrysis is the real mother and therefore must have seduced his son. He decides that to save face he must keep this quiet, but will have to evict her from his home. Chrysis is shocked by this sudden development and seeks refuge next door. In Act 4, Moschion returns and learns of what has occurred. He takes it up with his father, who eventually reveals that he knows of the child's true parentage. Nicaretos is shocked by this and goes to turn Chrysis out of his house. Moschion realises that his father is mistaken and explains the truth, just as a confused Nicaretos returns, having seen his own daughter suckling the baby. Moschion flees and Nicaretos tries to establish the truth from the women, but they refuse to explain to him and, much to her surprise, Demius comes to the defence of Chrysis, taking her back into his home. He tries to persuade Nicaretus that the child must be from a god, but that his son will marry his daughter for respectability. Moschion is upset at the thought that he was suspected of an affair with Chrysis and plans to enlist as a mercenary, knowing that his father will forbid it. As he prepares to leave, he doubts his own plan, but at last his father returns. At first he berates his son for forgetting all the good times that they had and for being so quick to blame his father for his own wrongdoings. But he then admits his own faults in the matter and, with Nicaretos, they leave for the wedding. The poor state of the first two acts of the play make a proper assessment difficult, but the play is criticised for a lack of dramatic action and any strong characters in the first half. There's little dramatic tension in the situation as the complications are resolved quite easily. However, the confusions and switching are obviously ripe for comic moments and despite the mutilated text and particularly in the second half, it's possible to see that the character of Demius in particular is drawn with some complexity. 
In his two long monologues, he is seriously conflicted by the position he believes himself to be in. These passages with a moralistic tone are contrasted by pacier scenes between the other characters and in the confused conversations with his son and neighbour as they try to unpick the truth of the situation. Maybe the good writing doesn't compensate for what appears to have been a very slow and lacklustre start. Perhaps it's not Menander at his best. It's difficult to tell. The arbitration is even less complete, with only about half the text available. This is especially sad, as it appears to be a play where Menander really hit his stride and produced a piece where character drives the action, which in turn further illustrates the characters. Some of the summary that follows is speculation, particularly for the early parts of the play, where little original text exists. Chirisius, a young and wealthy Athenian, has moved out of his home after his wife Pamphile gave birth only five months into their marriage. The child is in fact the result of a rape she suffered during a festival at the hands of a young man. The only evidence she has of this man is his signet ring. She's unhappy because she's grown to love her husband and now sees him wasting his time with drinking, women and other expensive entertainments to distract him from his disappointment in her. A cook, on his way to prepare a lavish meal for the young man, questions his servant, unable to understand why he is living this way with such an attractive wife at home. Theresius's favourite musician, Habiteronan, arrives for the evening. She is more than a musician, though, a hatarane, or courtesan, and they haggle over money with her owner until the wily servant Onesimus sorts it out. Simicrides, Pamphali's father, comes to investigate the situation and is persuaded by Onesimus that Tiresias is only attending the parties to keep an eye on his friend and to make sure he doesn't do anything too outrageous. Two tenants then arrive to pay their rent. One has a baby with them and we hear how Davos, the goat herd, has found the baby on the hillside and has taken it in. But on calculating the costs of rearing the child, he'd passed it on to Cyriscus the charcoal burner, who had just lost a child of his own. They had then argued over possession of the items left with the baby and were seeking an arbitrator in the matter. Sir Micronese agrees to hear the case and decides the possessions must go with the baby. As Cyriscus looks at the trinkets, Onesimus recognises the ring that his master lost at the festival. But he's reluctant to show it to him as he knows his master will be mortified that he abandoned a woman and child. The musician overhears the story and makes a plan to take the ring and wear it herself. Then Chiresius will recognise it and take her for the woman he violated and will be forced to take her in and save the child from a hard life. Monsumus knows very well that she's really only concerned with her own freedom and comfort. The end of the play is lost but it's assumed that the truth of the parentage of the baby is revealed, the plans of the musician are undone and the husband, wife and father-in-law are reconciled. Because of the state of the fragment, there is much speculation about the detail of Menander's intent and the potential subtleties of the stock characters. What can be admired with more certainty is the way the plot is moved along and every character fits their role and has an important part to play. It seems that here Menander found an economy in the plotting that means the play moves along at pace and some of the contrivances so well used in new comedy fit with character and action. The moments of irony also stand out more than in the misanthrop, something we know was always appreciated by the Greek audience. The date of the girl with her hair cut short is very uncertain, with 314 BCE or sometime shortly after that being the best guess, and only about 450 lines survive. With the beginning and end of most of the acts of the play missing, it's difficult to piece the story together, but once again we have two houses represented on stage, this time set in Corinth. Like others, the play depends on the protagonist being unaware of all the facts that the audience need to know, so a prologue with a god opens the play. Polyman is a mercenary soldier who lives unmarried with Glycaria. She has fled their home when Polyman threatened her when he learned from Sosius, his servant, that Glycaria was seen in a compromising position with his neighbour's son, Muscian. Muscian does indeed think himself in love with her, and in a jealous rage, Polyman cuts off her hair. 
With Glycaria sheltering with her neighbour Myrony, we learn in what has become known as the delayed prologue that Glycaria and Moschion, although raised separately, are brother and sister, and this was the only reason that she allowed him some intimacy with her. Act 2 is concerned with the servant Deos trying to use Glycaria's residence in the house to his advantage and with Moschion's hopes of her becoming his mistress, but all his attempts are thwarted by his mother. Polymon returns in Act 3, trying to gain entry to the house with a ragtag and comic array of assistance from slaves, a cook, a musician and a pig, but he's unsuccessful. In Act 4, Polymon's friend Patakius, an older man, tries to talk to Glycaria and she tells him about the truth of her relationship with Moschion to explain her actions, not realising that he is listening to the conversation. When she asks Patakios to get her possessions from Polymon's house for her, including the clothes she was exposed in as a baby, he realises that she and Moschion are the children he abandoned when he lost his fortune and his wife died. In the last act, Glycaria forgives Polymon, who asks forgiveness for his harsh actions. They marry, and Moschion is betrothed to another woman of his father's choosing. As stated, much of the text is missing, but we can see that the arc of the play follows the usual pattern for new comedy, where separated parties are reunited after a significant moment of recognition that parodies the recognition scene from the tragedies, and the acceptance of the outsider into society after suitable humiliation and forgiveness. The scene where Glycaria's hair is cut off is clearly a key one, representing the violence associated with mercenary soldiers at the time. In a society where women always wore their hair long, the cutting of it short was a very potent symbol and presumably enacted with the use of a mask with real hair attached. But it's a scene laced with the sort of subtlety that we've seen before from Menander. In the delayed prologue, the character of Innocence claims responsibility for the act, thereby allowing for Polymon's eventual rehabilitation. In the end, he and all the characters operating on the edge of society become proper responsible citizens. In the 2nd century CE, Plutarch wrote a comparison of Aristophanes and Menander. It's not contemporary, but it's the closest thing we have, and it's an interesting insight into how the sensibilities of society had changed over the years. Plutarch reduced Aristophanes to coarse words and vulgar joking that could captivate the ordinary citizen, but was abhorred by the educated. Menander's work, he says, has none of this. He praised his polished diction that was part of the consistent hold of his plays. His praise is effusive for the way the language weaves through the diverse characters and emotional variations shown on stage. In comparison, he finds Aristophanes veers from the mundane to the obscure, from tragic to comic, from vagueness to elevated dignity. This lack of cohesion within the play is, he says, pleasing to no one and unendurable for those who put any thought to it. He compares the work to a prostitute who is past her prime and offends society by becoming a wife, while for him Menander is all charm and satisfaction. He says that of all the artistic output of Greece, Menander made the most beautiful and acceptable work and concludes by saying that there is no reason for the educated man to go to the theatre other than to see Menander. Wow, some praise, and clearly unfair to Aristophanes, and unjustified for Menander. It probably says more about Plutarch than Menander or Aristophanes, but Plutarch and the Romans did love Menander, so his appeal was clearly broader than that of Aristophanes. Although Menander's theatrical scope is seen as narrow and confined to the domestic, it was less specifically Athenian than the old comedy and the tragedies. It may not be insignificant that Menander was the only major writer of new comedy who was native Athenian. All the others we know of came from other parts of the Hellenistic world, and although they confined themselves to this narrow domestic scope, it was a representation of life that could be transported to Magna Graecia and onto the Roman world centuries later. But that expression of the transition from Greek to Roman gets us a little ahead of ourselves, as we leave Menander bringing a little gentle joy to the rather dark world of Athens. Next time, I'm going to take a step backwards and take a look at the mysterious satire play, the comic burlesque that rescued the Athenians from the trauma of the classic trilogies. The content and purpose of the satire play is much speculated over, which is not surprising as we only have one and a bit examples preserved. 
So in another shorter than usual episode that will be released very shortly, come back with me once again to the time of the great Athenian tragedies. I look forward to your company next time, but if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. Thank you.